Hello everyone, welcome to the first video in a new project that we're going to be calling Data Vault. Um, this is now the third time that I'm trying to record this video, um, so I'm hoping that this will uh, be the right one uh, to upload. So in this one, uh, or in this video, we're going to talk about what the application will be, what the project is going to uh, encompass, um, just the general purpose. We're going to go through some of the files that we're going to need. Um, and from these files, we're going to talk about the structure and how the data will be stored. Um, but also, this will lend to what types of, uh, what, what the code is that we're going to have to include. So the thing about this project is um, it's going to be integrating a lot of the stuff that we have written in previous videos. So stuff like encryption algorithms, hashing, uh, data structures, stuff like that. I wanted to, I, there was uh, this sort of application in the back of my mind when we were going through all the, all the encryption and stuff. Um, so the whole part, the whole purpose of this application is simply to store and encrypt uh, data for users uh, on their computers. So um, it's simply going to be encrypting uh, entries. So, and by entries, I mean, um, a, a map between uh, uh, an entry title to a dictionary that so it's kind of be it's gonna be like a JSON structure so for example we would have um, you know Google so in our dictionary here we would have Google which maps to a dictionary um, which has categories and stuff so we might have a password which would be PWD123 something like that username, user123. That's essentially what we're going to be doing and we're going to be encrypting that data. Um, so in each entry, we're going to have the title of the entry. So if it's used as a password manager, you could use the t you could have the title as a website name. So title and then map category names to values. We're going to start by uh, looking at the primary file, which we're going to call data. And we're going to give them all uh, a common ending or extension as uh, .dv. And the purpose is just going to be, this is going to be the main data storage. Uh, so store encrypted data. Um, and for the organization, uh, we're going to look at uh, an example here. And I'm representing this in blocks of 16 bytes. So because we're using encryption, uh, we're typically going to want to use AES, which requires 16 byte blocks. So the organization is going to have 16 byte blocks, um, which you can just see here by the four by four blocks that we have here. So 16 bytes are here. Um, so an example entry would be uh, we're going to we're going to number these blocks uh, starting for, with one, so zero one, and you'll see why it's uh, one in a second. Um, and let's say the first entry was Google. And with Google, um, like we had up here, so we have a password and a username. Um, so the first uh, value will be user name. That's our username. And then we'll put our password as, as password123. So the first nine bytes are the username and the uh, second 11 bytes are the password. So that's, that's good there. And then this second block would be zero two. So the the main concern that we're going to have here now is, uh, well, first, what do we want to do if we have multiple entries? Do we want to put them after this block? So do we want to just start GitHub, say right here? Do we want to start that entry right there? And we're not going to do that just because um, we're going to try and be careful with how we design this. So if we were to put GitHub right after, we would have to load in all the data at once when we start the application. So all of this, we would have to load it in, um, and it would just be a, it would be very, and if we were to move around data, so if we were to insert, like, so if we had our GitHub username, so GH, you enter our GitHub username, if we wanted to insert some Google data, uh, it would be a little weird about decrypting this whole block moving this down uh, and then re-encrypting it, which would require all the values here to be moved down. So we would have to re-encrypt everything. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to keep one entry uh, per block or all the data in one block belongs to one entry. So you can't share. Um, but then what we're also going to do is um, uh, store uh, the continuation block index. So for example, we, if we have Google up here, which takes up blocks 01 and 02, and then we're going to start GitHub on the uh, block 03. So user name and then pass word. So what would happen now if we wanted to uh, add some data to Google? So if we wanted to um, add, say, a security question, well, what do we do now? We could, uh, in theory, move uh, the block, the GitHub's block down, um, but you can kind of see how that could be a problem because we would be shifting down uh, this initial block here. And uh, if you're thinking ahead, we're going to have to map this value, so Google, to the initial block. So Google will have to be mapped to 0, 1 somehow. And GitHub will have to be mapped to 0, 3 somehow. Um, now, if, we're, if we have a big map and we are shift in, if we insert a block, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to um, increment all these values by one. So this would have to become a zero four. And that wouldn't, that's not what we, that's not very desirable um, just because that's going to require iterating through some sort of structure and that which could take a while. So all we're going to do is we're going to have it, uh, have the continuation block down here. So to continue on the entry, we have security quest and that just continues as question like so. But now this is block 04. How is the program going to know? Okay, well, Google's block starts at 01, just from a map. We'll specify that in a second. How do we know to go from block 02 to 04? So what we're going to do is we're going to store um, the continuation block as an integer. Uh, I was thinking about data sizes to use, but I'm going to keep it as four bytes for now, but that could uh, be expensive. So I might do three bytes. I, um, I will play around with a few things, but I think uh, I'll just keep it for four now just to, just because this is conceptual. So we have the continuation block, which is marked over here. So zero, 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 four. This will tell the program, okay, we're reading Google data. We start at block one. And now block one has to point to block two if we're following this format. So zero, 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 two. So the program reads the data, sees it decrypts at first. So this will be encrypted. And then when we decrypt it, we see username one PAS. And then the, the last four bytes in the block will point to the next block. So this will go to block two. Um, and then read more data, security. All right, we have a continuation block zero, 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 four. And then we find the, the uh, data there. Now, what's going to happen is um, when we're done with an entry, we will just have the 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, which is why we don't have a block at index 0. So that's that number is reserved, in a, essentially. That's how the blocks are going to be uh, arranged. But how about the internal format? When, we, when we're reading a Google, the Google's entry, how are we going to know to map these nine characters to the username? Well, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have two things. So the first one is to mark the end of an entry and start mark the beginning of another entry. And we're just going to use a null terminator character. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's the end of the string and it, it will just be a zero value. Now, how do we class now that, we, that we've split up? So username PAS and then PAS D because we're continuing on one, two, three. Well, we have to mark the end of the password with another zero and then, um, security answer also has to mark be marked uh, with that ter terminator character after that and then for github it's just to replace the e here oh and then i also did forget to say um those last four bytes since github has only one block the continuation block index will be zero and then, then the password will also be marked with the termination character so if we were to read this data in, we would see that we have uh, user name is one entry, 
then PAS D12 is another entry. But how are we going to classify uh, each entry base, like as a category? Well, we can take one more byte out of this, or we're not going to take a byte out in the file, but I'm just demonstrating it now. Um, we'll take the first byte of the of each uh, mapping um, or of each data value, and that will set that as some uh, category ID. So for username, say we could set it to zero, and that would map to username. So zero maps to username, and then password would be one. So one maps the password and then security uh, would be three or let's start the numbering at one so then we have uh, one map to username two map to password and three map to security answer um, and this will also be done in another uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to map this so we so far have two required mappings the entry name entry title to its initial block and then category IDs to their string names um, so now when we read this we see that the category id for this first one is one so we see that it's a username and then we read a string until we find a terminator character so we'll, for google we'll see that one maps to username which will be then our ca second category id is two and that will read the as and then we go to the next block and we see the D12. So two maps to password, which will have a value of AS D12. And then three maps to uh, security questions. So that'll be our third category. And we will just read this until we, so we'll go to the next block and then, um, which will be block four. And then we'll read until we get a zero. And um, I haven't been writing it, but these zeros here are literal zero values in character form, not ASCII character zeros. Um, the backslash zero is just a terminator, so I'm just putting it that there. Uh, the two and one, the numbers are also just numerical values. We're going to be treating them as unsigned values. Uh, but anything that has quotes around it or is a letter is treated as an ASCII character. So it would have some value like 65, I think, for the A. Um, but the third one would be security answer, which would map to just like that. So that's Google. And then uh, for GitHub, I'll just go through this pretty quickly. Um, once again, the first byte will now be a, a zero for, or a one for a username. And then the password will be two, I believe it was. Yeah, username and password. Um, so we read a category ID as the username and then the um, password is just two characters, which you should not do. And then the username value is written as S-E-R-N-A-M and then two is mapped to a password. Now in the actual application, we're not going to be taking bit, bytes of data out and replacing them with category IDs. I'm just doing this simply for the uh, demonstration of how we're going to format the data. But once we format it, um, we will see that we will essentially concatenate strings. So we'll concatenate uh, an ID, a category ID with the category value with a null terminator character. So they're going to be, no data is going to be removed. And that's how uh, the data is going to be stored. And as you can see, we now have two different maps that we uh, already need. So we have a name to an in initial block and then also category ID to a name. So I'm going to do the category ID first just because it's um, it's simplest. Uh, so that's going to be in, uh, we'll have, we're going to have another file called category.dv. It'll just be a character for the ID and then the string title. So we have the one, oh sorry, we need to terminate this with a uh, null terminator. So that's why we can't use a zero as an ID because that's going to terminate the, terminate the string. So pass, and this, this file will be continuous. Password, um, and then uh, three, security answer. That's the category mapping. Um, but now we still have the problem of, uh, of doing the entries to their initial blocks. And um, what we can do is, uh, we're going to break this up into two parts. We're first going to map 
uh, an entry a name to an ID. So let's say Google has ID 00. So this is the ID. And then this ID will be mapped to a 01, an initial block, ID X. And then similar, similarly for GitHub, GitHub will be mapped to 01 for an ID, which will then be mapped to 03 for an index. So we want to break it up because uh, in theory, you can change the name of your entry. So Google could become, or you know, more recently, Facebook can become Meta or however you pronounce it. Um, so if you change your, your Facebook entry, you would want to change the name. That would require uh, resorting in whatever map that we had. Uh, but what we can do is just have an ID as the constant that represents this entry, which will map to an initial index. For the first stage of this mapping is mapping string names to IDs. So what that's going to look like is in this other file, map.dv, we're going to map a name to an ID. So Google uh, backslash zero. And then so we'll have a string terminator character and then four bytes for the uh, integer ID. So that's zero, 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 zero. And then GitHub, GitHub terminator character. And then we have a zero, 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 one as the, as the, as its ID. So this map will be loaded in and we'll be able to find out the IDs of each entry. All right, now for the mapping of the ID to the index, this is going to be pretty simple. Um, if you've ever done anything on databases before, you would, um, or if you've ever looked at like how databases are actually created, um, you might be familiar with a B tree, which we did a few videos on uh, previously. And what B trees do is they're really good at mapping uh, integers to integers. Uh, so they will, um, and they're typically used in databases because uh, they will sort integer keys um, based on their values and they will map those integer keys to whatever value, uh, say an index in a database. So this will be really nice because in btree.dv we can store an integer ID as 0000. zero, zero, zero and then map it to 0, 0, 0, 001 as the initial block. And we know that this whole row here is ID and IDX, and this is a pair. We don't need any terminator characters because these are all constant length values. And then similarly for 0, 0, 0, 0001 for the ID, the initial block for GitHub is 0, 0, 0, 0003 as IDX. So that's our third map, btree.dv. So map.dv will map uh, the name to an ID. So this is done through map.dv. And then id to idx will be map, mapped through btree.dv. Well, you might be wondering, well, why do we need so many, so many files if we're just gonna be loading in the data? Well, the point is, I think I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that we don't want to load in all this data. We don't want to load in the entire data.dv file because it could be massive. So uh, the way we're going to deal with this is that instead of loading in that, we're going to load in these three files here, which have abstractions of the data. So map.dv contains a, these three files contain crucial information that we need to load in, a da load in the data, but it's just enough where, uh, where it's less taxing on the memory. So if we load in these three files on initialization, we will um, we'll be set to load in the data whatever whenever we need it. So for example, we'll log in, load in the data. And then um, as soon as we want some data, so say we wanted the GitHub data, we would pass in a request, passing in the GitHub name, and then we would pass that name into the ID map, which would return a zero one, and then we would pass the zero one into a B tree which would then return a zero three as the initial index. And then we could go into data.dv, load in this block, decrypt it, read the data, know that there's not another block, continuation block, because the zeros at the end. And then we could return the data, whichever we requested it, and we'll parse it as with the categories and all. So those are gonna be the files that we 
uh, use. So let's do a quick recap in the table. We're gonna have here, so we have data.dv, uh, which has 16 byte blocks, 12 bytes for the data entries, and then four bytes for the continuation block, which is an integer. And then as for the entries, we have um, uh, character category ID, string value, and then a null terminator character. Um, so that's data.dv. Then we also have the map.dv, which if you remember, maps string uh, titles to entry IDs. And the organization on this one was a list of entries. So since we're not loading, since the data.dv is the only one that we're loading in certain blocks at a time, that's why we have this complex structure with the with the block index indices. But for these three, we can just put in a list and it won't matter because we're going to be loading all of it in at once. So it's a list of entries um, with string name, uh, terminator character, and then the numer integer numerical ID, which is four bytes. Um, then we have btree.dv, which will have uh, map entry ID to initial block. And that's going to be another list of entries, integer um, numerical ID, integer uh, initial block. Once again, four bytes each. And then categories.dv will be mapping category IDs uh, to category name. And the way this is going to be is a uh, list of entries um, with an uh, character numerical ID and then a string name and then a term terminated character and now uh, we can talk about encryption which is uh, where a lot of the stuff that we have worked on will come into play so the hash algorithms the AES and that's gonna be all fun here so we're gonna have three more files um, and I'm going to just first describe how um, these files are going to be encrypted. So we're going to be using AES-256 um, for the files. Uh, with a key, we will call data key right now. And I'll keep it like that for now, and we'll add to it. Now, anyone who's uh, into cryptography will realize that there's a problem here. Um, we're not using any initialization vectors. Now, for those who don't know uh, much about cryptography, what is an initialization vector? An initialization initialization vector is uh, um, is going to be a cr it's going to play a crucial role in ensuring the integrity of your data. So AES is a deterministic algorithm. It produces the same result every time. So AES uh, with key K and data X is going to give you Y, no matter uh, when you call it, no matter what. That's always going to do it. Um, I mean, depending on the mode, but with the same parameters, you're not going to get a random output every time. That's uh, the, this, It's a deterministic algorithm. There's no random aspect to the actual algorithm itself. It may look randomized, but there is, there's nothing that's random. We don't call random at all in that function. Um, so what the problem is, if we, let's say that uh, Alice... I'll use the Alice and Bob example. Let's say Alice has um, data X that she wants to protect. And she has it in four locations. So these are just different locations in, in whatever, in her computer. And she encrypts AES using AES with a key and X and gets out a Y, uh, Y1. Now, Bob, somehow he knows that y1 maps to x, but he does not know the key. So the key is unknown to Bob. Now, if Alice wants to encrypt x again, so if she wanted to have two copies of it, or just if, she, if x appeared somewhere else in some other file as its own block, she encrypts it in location two, she's gonna get y1 again, just because once again, AES is deterministic. Now, Bob, 
knowing that Y1 maps to X, if he has access to Alice's memory or files, he will he can infer that location O2 is X as well without knowing uh, or just by looking at the encrypted content. So we need to establish a way where Alice can, in different locations, get different results for the same encryption. So let's try introducing something called an initialization vector. So she encrypts using the same key, same data, but this time passes in an IV, IV1 or initialization vector one. And I'll just call Y1, Y2 for that one. And from here, I'll actually just call this IV3. And here we get Y3. And once again, let's say, well, this doesn't help us right now, but let's just say Bob knows that Y3 maps to X, doesn't know, and he doesn't know the key. So the key is still unknown to Bob, but he knows that Y3 maps to X. Now, in a different location, Alice will call AES encrypt with the same key, same data, but this time a different initialization vector. So she calls it with IV4. This gives us a different output that is not equal to Y3 because we have different parameters. Now, depending on what mode you're using, the initialization, initialization vector will play a different role. However, the advantage of this is that if Bob knows that Y3 maps to X, he cannot infer that Y4 maps to X. There's no logical mapping to that. He can know the IVs. Um, it's just he doesn't know the key. So AES, or just based on the security of AES, uh, you give a different initialization vector, you're going to get a different output. So we cannot infer that Y4 uh, maps to X. So what we're going to do now is in all of our files, we're going to have a different IV. Because let's say that we had um, maybe not, well, I mean, the, applying it to one of these files or applying it to one group of these files wouldn't really work because uh, none of these files are formatted the same. I mean, you could potentially figure it out. Maybe you could probably find the same pattern of bytes somewhere. Um, but let's say we had two uh, users using the same application and they had the same block. If one person knew that one, that one of those blocks mapped to some decrypted data, they could infer about the other one if we aren't using IVs. Um, so we're going to use an initialization vector that is specific to each file and each user. So IV is equal to data IV. Uh, IV is equal to map IV. IV is equal to B-tree IV. And then IV is equal to category IV. So we have four different in initialization vectors and we're going to store them in a file. IV.dv uh, stores initialization vectors. Um, and initialization vectors in AES have to be um, 16 bytes because they are one block. So blocks of 16 bytes. And what we're going to have data IV, map IV, B-tree IV, and category IV. And this is not going to be encrypted. And it doesn't need to be encrypted because, once again, Bob can know the IV. It's just he doesn't know the key, so we can't, uh, he can't draw the connections between Y3 and Y4. Now, um, what about this data key? We still haven't figured out what this is going to be. Um, so now we're going to talk a little, a little bit about um, methodologies on how to uh, create a data key. Um, so, you know, there are stupid people out there who have passwords like PWD123. And for a very uh, unsecure application, um, all you would store this password, uh, we're first going to talk about storing the password and then we're going to talk about how we use the password. Um, so the, the pretty much uh, way you would store this password is um, you would hash it. So you would hash, well, we're going to use SHA. So we're going to create another file here um, called pwd.dv. 
stores the user password um, 64 byte hash and the encryption here is just SHA it's not really encryption but I'm just gonna write it in here so SHA3512 um, so that's the hash uh, and similarly to AES uh, we're going to have an extra parameter because if we have say two users with the same password with this same stupid password there are things called rainbow sheets that have common password uh, hash results so there's there's like sheet with pwd123 12345 and it just goes down and on and on with results of passing these passwords through hash functions so similarly to AES, if you have two instances of the same hash, you can infer, and you know that one hash was generated with this one uh, key, then you can infer that the other hash was also generated with that key. So if there are multiple users who have the same, the same password, uh, the hash will be the same. So you can infer that they, that they, um, you can infer that, that they, that they have the same uh, input key. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a uh, assault, what's called assault, and it plays the same role as the initialization vector, except with SHA or with the hash, you're just going to append, you're going to concatenate it to the end of the password. And if the salt is different for everyone, then you will have uh, a different hash result for everyone. So user password is uh, appended with salt, and that's going to be an, another parameter in this um, function here so we'll say salt is pwd salt and we will also store this salt in the iv file so pwd salt and once again this salt doesn't need to be encrypted so that's our hash password um, now let's go back to looking at the password so now that we know how to store it securely let's look at the password again so can the user password equal the data key so can we use the user password as our encryption key. And there are three um, uh, reasons why we should not do this. Um, well, the length is one. Length is not 32. For AES-256, we need a 32-byte uh, key. So, so not 32 bytes. Security. It's not a. It's not a good password. Um, there are. I mean, this one isn't too much of a concern just because the algorithm itself is as uh, secure but if someone knows your application if they had access to uh the format here um like the the decrypted content they could just take basic passwords like pwd123 with a bunch of zeros at the end because that could be the way that we derive our data key um and then just encrypt that common format here so this common block with all of the uh the basic passwords and just see what gives the result that's in the file system so it, this is a security reason too so security is another concern and then finally if we wanted to change the password so let's say that our user is not an idiot and they like changing their password well if we used this password as our data key let's say it was 32 bytes let's say we found some way to do it if we use it as the encryption key or some derived form of this changing this key would require us to decrypt all of this stuff so everything in here would have to be decrypted and re-encrypted using the new key which would be a long and expensive process so um it would yeah it would just take a while so what we're going to do is for each user we are going to instead of using their password we're going to generate a random data key so data key is going to be a random 32 byte string that's terrible handwriting so let's compare this now the length is equal to 32 good it's secure it's random you can't just if you wanted to test all the passwords you would have to test two to the 32 possibilities go for it but it's secure um and if you you're not going to change the password but 
it, it could be changed just for security reasons, but it's not changed often. So if you did want to change your data key, you could do that. Um, and then you could decrypt all the data, do all that, and that would be fine. Um, but you would rather change your password more. Um, so, all right, we have our data key, which um, we mentioned up here. But how are we going to connect the data key to the password? Because there needs to be some sort of connection. So we need to send our user password into some black box and out comes the data key. How are we going to do this? Well, we've already ruled out that we can't derive the user password from the data key because even if we did use it, if we, even if we used a secure derived form, if we changed the password, it would be a long process. So what we're going to do is instead of using the user password as the data key, we're going to use the user password to encrypt the data key. So, or use a derived form. Um, so use user password to encrypt data key. And that's another thing, this data key has to be stored somewhere, so it's gonna be in another file, another file up here, we'll call this uh, data key.dv, stores uh, data key, and it's gonna be uh, 32 bytes, so uh, 32 byte key, and it's gonna be encrypted with AES-256, and uh, we're gonna have a key, it's equal to something, and an IV, which is equal to a uh, data key IV. But what is this key? Once again, we have run into the problem. Well, how are we gonna generate a key here? Well, in this case, it's okay to use um, a derived key from this because uh, if you change the password, the only thing you would have to decrypt and re-encrypt is just the user's data key, which is 32 bytes, which would not be a long and expensive process. So we have to use a derived form. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send this user password into some function and out is going to pop a key encryption key which is going to be 32 bytes and this function will also take in that as a dk length so derived key length is equal to 32 so some algorithm um, and then we would use this key encryption key as the key to AES decryption. And we pat and then we're going to pass in the data key IV here. And out pops our data key. Which is also 32 bytes. Question is what is this? Uh, you've heard me say the word key derivation now. And uh, well, we created a key derivation algorithm or we implemented one, we didn't create it. And that's the PBKDF2 algorithm, password based key derivation function two. And it also requires in a salt, which we will call KEK -E salt. So the password based key derivation function takes in a user's password, doesn't matter how weak it is, takes in a derived key length, which is the output length of 32, takes in a salt, takes in those three parameters, runs a bunch of stuff. Uh, it's pretty secure. It generates a very, uh, a ran, not a randomized, I won't, I'm not gonna say a randomized, but it generates a very, through a bunch of calls to hashing, uh, it's gonna generate um, a king, uh, a, a random or not, I keep saying random, but a pseudo random uh, output. It's not random, it's pseudo random output. Um, and this key will has all of our specifications that we want. Its uh, length is equal to 32. Uh, then we have, um, it's secure. It's not a basic, uh, it's not a basic uh, password like PWD, PWD123. And once again, if we change this password, it won't be an expensive process just to change 32 bytes, to decrypt and re-encrypt 32 bytes. So, we're going to have another another few values that I need to add in uh, to our files here. Um, so we have a password salt, which we uh, take in as um, 
is the hash. We have the data key IV, and then we also have the key KEK salt. So we have our KEK salt, and then data key IV. And then now we have an answer to this question. AES-256 takes in the key as KEK, or the key encryption key. And that's derived from the password. But just to kind of reiterate the point about the connection between the user password and the data key, if we take a big rectangle and draw it around this, we see that this big, big rectangle can be considered as this black box that we have here. So yeah, that is essentially how the encryption process is going to work for uh, our application. When we log in, we're gonna take the user password, derive a key encryption key, use that key encryption key to decrypt the data key, and the data key will then be stored, and it will be used to decrypt all the data that we need um, according to this specification. We're gonna load in the map, the B tree, and the category map all uh, throughout the entire ex execution and then whenever we, we request it we will go into data find the specific block that we want um, and then uh, change it around so yeah that's uh, the overview of how the project is going to look like what it's going to look like um, or not how, what it's going to look like but what it's going to be under the hood uh, in future videos we're going to be talking about sequences and like the login sequence uh, adding a data sequence um, we're going to be looking at how to implement what we're going to call a controller. So that will be the first part of um, this application, uh, implementing the controller, which will be the back end stuff. And then we'll work on the what I'm going to call a UI, um, which will probably just be for now uh, console input. Um, but maybe we'll figure out a way to put that into a GUI at some point. Um, but yeah, so that's exciting to look forward to. But my the really cool thing about this is that if you look at the map, so we have a map here, which we can maybe use as an AVL tree, I don't know. Category, maybe another AVL tree, you never know, or a hash map. B tree is a B tree. Uh, and then data is just nothing in specific. Or maybe even JSON if you, if you feel so uh, inclined. But the point is weaving, we have implemented all of these data structures and algorithms. We go back to the encryption, AES and SHA, we have implemented all these algorithms. PBKDF2, we did that. So we're gonna be taking in a lot of these algorithms and uh, data structures, we're gonna be putting them in, integrating them into our application, and we're just gonna be taking, using them as tools essentially uh, to make our application, which is gonna be awesome. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Um, we'll be doing some more of this. Uh, in, right, this will be what I'll, I'll be focusing on mainly uh, for near future. Um, but yeah, so that's all I have for you guys today. Hope you guys enjoyed, um, and uh, I will see you in the next video. Have a good one.